All right, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Jill Goodwin. I'm the conference manager for iDigBio, and this is the first webinar in the series checking in on TCNs and their networks of digitization knowledge. Uh, today, uh, for our first uh, TCN presentation uh, series of presentations, we have the importance of 3D imaging and current trace-based mammal trait-based mammal research with the winners of the Ranges Imaging Mini Awards. Um, Kit is additionally, Kit's going to put a link in the chat to our announcement page. Next week, we'll be hearing from the Overt and the Nocturne folks, um, and we will have other uh, TCN presentations that are following in the series. So um, keep a tune, I guess they'll be continuous. Uh, keep stay tuned, and we'll be having updates uh, posted on that announcement page. Um, but we really appreciate everybody for joining today, and thank you to all the speakers. And I am going to pass the mic to Dave Bloom to get us started here. Great, thank you, Jill. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, glad that you could all join us, uh, and hopefully, some more folks will continue to join throughout the hour. At least I expect a few people will be a bit late um, as they have communicated to me. Um, I just would like to kick things off here with a couple of logistics very quickly. Um, we have uh, four uh, of the six winners of our uh, of the Ranges Imaging Awards uh, here to present to us today. Actually one is uh, in the field and, and so we'll have a pre-recorded version of his talk uh, with us. And then uh, Brian uh, McLean, who's the primary PI on the Ranges project, will also say a few words. Um, if you have any questions uh, for the speakers uh, or presenters, uh, please put them in the Q&A, uh, and we will try to get to those uh, whenever we have a gap, either in between presentations or at the end. Uh, I assume most questions will be answered towards the end of the session. Uh, but feel free also to use the chat freely um, and uh, um, just give us whatever communications that you have, uh, thoughts or ideas, recommendations, references, or resources. Uh, that would be great. Recipes and jokes are always welcome as well. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I will just, my job is is mostly just to be the time cop. Uh, and I will begin that now. Um, and so I will first introduce uh, Brian McLean from uh, University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Uh, he is the lead PI on the Ranges project, and he'll tell us a bit more about Ranges and the Imaging Award. Brian? Thank you, Dave. Good, great to see everyone. Um, we're happy to be here and kind of help kick off the TCN focused series. Let me. Uh, try to share my screen. Is this looking right? Dave, give me a thumbs up. Good, okay. Um, great to see everyone. Um, so I'm just um, here to kind of get us rolling and talk about uh, the Ranges Thematic Collections Network, which uh, I am leading with the great help of a lot of other people. Um, let me turn off my captioning. So Ranges is a TCN that exists to mobilize trait data. Uh, there's a lot of trait data latent in collections of mammals across the country and across the world, in fact. And um, those have great power to tell us something about uh, response to change, how mammals adapt to different uh, and variable environments. Currently, it's very hard to access and use those traits despite you know the communities a lot of us live in of ecology and evolution um, and other sciences needing access to high quality traits mammals tend to have a lot of traits associated with them as specimens this is um, uh, a few possible morphological traits that are often associated with mammals in addition to these things like reproductive data both external and internal metrics um, and Ecological associations and habitat associations are also often buried um, in collections, on tags, on catalogs, and things where they can't really be used for research. So again, ranges exist to kind of liberate all of this information, 
where are the um, why are the traits not currently available? It's often the case that um, traits become stuck in collections management um, systems at the institutional level. They never make it out to any kind of aggregator. Even if they do make it out to the aggregator, they can become stuck in various Darwin core fields, often things like dynamic properties, um, in highly, highly heterogeneous formats. So this makes them hard to um, harvest and use even if they make it to aggregators. <clears throat> So ranges is this group of people of 23 institutions that you see here, um, all working together to standardize trait names and terms and definitions and digitize traits and make them available to the community online and associated with the specimen records. Um, our focus is Western North America. And so all the presenters you'll hear from today have kind of a component of their research that's focused on mammals um, that inhabit Western North America. And this is um, our first mandate is to digitize traits from mammals uh, from this vast and really interesting region. Ranges is a community of practice. Um, our goal is to reconnect mammologists and museum professionals and um, informaticians to really work together on these problems. Uh, and as I said before, our, the goal is really to digitize and mobilize specimen level trait data um, for mammals of Western North America with an initial focus on all non-marine mammal species. And we hope that this is going to result in a more extended specimen network for mammals that includes, um, you know, traits that are kind of a central part of the, the second tier of knowledge emerging from specimens. Um, and that, as I said, will include traits that come from specimen labels that are morphological or reproductive in nature, um, from field notes and catalogs, and from a smaller number of um, actual physical specimen images. And um, we hope that these are kind of, this, this corpus of traits will kind of come to be um, by digitizing in a really highly standardized format, which all of our network members are kind of doing right now and working very hard at, but then also using some informatics tools to extract those traits from the occurrence records and kind of standardize them, validate them and repurpose them and publish them in a couple different places. So everyone will be able to find and use them. What you'll hear from today are um, um, some of the recipients of a small grant opportunity that we've been able to implement called the Ranges Imaging Mini Awards. And um, this is really the work of researchers who have targeted questions. And so um, Ranges doesn't exist to produce 3D imagery of specimens. Um, moving taxonomically, but exists to fund people to do that work um, around existing research projects. And so what you'll hear today about are, is, um, you know, re digitization of specimens, not for the sole purpose of digitizing them, but for the purpose of some really interesting research. And so I will um, turn it over um, and thank all the members of ranges, including um, the lead uh, PIs here. And I will look forward to hearing from all of our presenters. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I appreciate you doing that for us and setting the stage or the table, as it were, so the next four speakers can eat well. Um, uh, so I think we're just going to jump right into it here. If anybody has any questions, uh, about ranges or about the imaging award, um, please put those in the Q and A uh, or save them until the end, uh, and we can answer those too. Um, just as a personal note, I actually think that at least for outreach uh, for NSF grants and for TCNs, and uh, more specifically, um, the way that we've structured the uh, the these mini awards is actually a pretty innovative way uh, to expand outreach opportunities um, uh, of, of various projects. And um, it's one of the more exciting parts of the uh, of the entire TCN, I think. That's just my opinion. Um, at any rate, uh, we'll carry on here. Uh, so our first speaker um, is uh, Sydney Decker. Uh, she is at the Ohio State University. I um, always like to emphasize the the with that one. Uh, and without uh, too much more ado, she's going to speak to us about skull morphology 
uh, variation across environmental conditions in widely distributed yellow bats. So Sydney, it's all yours. All right, thank you very much. Let me get my screen set up. Looks good. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so as Dave said, my name is Sydney Decker. I'm in my final year of my PhD here at Ohio State. And today I'm excited to talk about an amazing imaging data set that we have collected as part of my dissertation work to assess skull morphology across environmental conditions in yellow bats. So we know that morphological traits that facilitate resource acquisition are key to evolution, and we expect that traits related to foraging vary across ecological niche. Skull morphology is particularly important in insectivorous bats due to evolutionary constraints of flight, echolocation, and prey capture. However, relationships between skull morphology and foraging niche in the literature is pretty complex, particularly at lower taxonomic levels. These unresolved relationships could be in part due to difficulties adequately capturing morphological variation within a species. Though many studies that use high resolution volumetric data focus on macroevolutionary questions, advances in imaging and analysis workflows provide us with the opportunity to explore evolutionary response to ecological conditions at the level at which speciation occurs. An ideal system to address these questions are the yellow bats. Um, they're a group of tree roosting bats in the Lazarine group, so they're related to hoary and red bats, some of the prettiest bats in North America. Yellow bats are widely distributed across the southern United States, Central America, and South America, and across their ranges they occur in very disparate habitat types, including xeric conditions uh, in the Sonoran Desert, as well as the Brazilian Amazon rainforest. Yellow bats are insectivorous with some observations in the literature for beetle preference, which can require more robust skulls to process the carapace of beetles. Across these ecoregions, we expect differences in prey assemblages, which could further diversify skull shape in yellow bats. There are four named species of yellow bats, but there are multiple proposed lineages across ecoregions. Uh, but yellow bats exhibit minimal external morphological differences, but high genetic diversity, which may indicate the presence of cryptic species and local adaptation to environmental conditions. To capture morphological variation in yellow bats, we performed both 2D and 3D imaging. 2D imaging was conducted using a standard Nikon digital camera, and we took multiple views of the cranium and mandible. Specimens were landmarked on consistently identifiable features using TPS dig, and uh, geometric morphometric analyses were performed using the R package geomorph. We conducted the 3D imaging using a thermoscientific HeLa scan micro CT scanner. Scans were conducted at 20 micron voxel resolution, and all the acquisition and reconstruction parameters were standardized across scans so that we could automate processing and analysis steps. Surface modeling, segmentation, landmarking, and pseudo-landmarking were all performed using 3D Slicer and the Slicer Morph extension. So we performed geometric morphometric analyses from the 2D images of specimens, but were fairly limited by our ability to consistently identify landmarks from the images. Bat skulls are fairly notorious for this issue, um, not only to their, due to their small size, with these skulls being less than two centimeters in total length, but because their cranial bones are heavily fused and suture sites and other morphological landmarks are difficult to identify at this resolution. Our statistical analysis confirms these difficulties as the three species uh, we were able to image overlap heavily in morphospace. Though the analyses identified that specific uh, morphological features such as sagittal crest height and mandible width were heavily implicated in the variants captured by the first principal components, our landmarking scheme kind of fell short in providing informative morphological uh, data to separate out any sort of variation across the landscape. This lack of resolution from the 2D image data set was pretty expected, um, so we collected the 3D image data set to hopefully overcome these issues. Uh, this is a quick diagram showing that 
we can use landmarking schemes on 3D reconstructions, which can more than double the number of data points for each specimen. Or we can use automated pseudo landmarking schemes, which can increase the resolution of the shape data by 100 times. These workflows afford us the ability to collect morphological data at a resolution um, that I think rivals the advancements that we've made going from single locus data to genomic level data in population genetic studies. So we've completed micro CT scanning of 105 yellow bat specimens for a total of over 200 scan data sets as we imaged crania and mandibles independently. This amounted to an astounding 230 hours of micro CT scan data collection prior to any processing steps. And we were able to image specimens from every proposed yellow bat lineage with the exception of the exceptionally rare Cuban yellow bat and almost all eco regions within the species ranges for a very well sampled species level data set. And we can see from the micro CT scans pictured um, that there are morphological differences between the three species we were able to image, um, even though these were not captured by our geometric morphometrics from the 2D images. We can see differences in the sagittal crest height, um, the shape of the brain case, and differences in the shape of the zygomatic arch across species. So we are very confident that the resolution of these data will enable us to find biologically meaningful variation, both between species and across geographic space within species. We're currently exploring different methods of summarizing the micro CT scan data for downstream analyses. We plan to utilize automated pseudo landmarking methods that use a template designed on a reconstructed surface model, which is then applied across specimens in the data set to create a simplified surface mesh representation of these complex 3D structures. This framework would essentially allow us to turn millions of years of complex morphological evolution into some fairly simple math, uh, which I think is pretty neat. In addition to the imaging that we've conducted to estimate morphological variation, we've collected a complementary genomic data set and are working to curate a data set of environmental variables to take an integrative approach to investigating variation across these disparate environmental conditions. We plan to analyze these data with established statistical methods, including, including uh, dimensionality reduction approaches, as well as identifying covariates of skull shape using partial least squares approaches. We're also working in collaboration with the Imageomics Institute to identify machine learning frameworks to integrate the three data sources to further assess variation within and between yellow bat species. Collecting these data also provides some opportunities um, for very interesting further studies. We intentionally performed uh, micro CT imaging at identical acquisition parameters across scans to maximize our ability to compare across specimens. In doing so, we were able to calculate changes in the relative density of cranial and mandibular bones across populations. Bats in particular experience a lot of opposing evolutionary forces acting to ensure that skulls are light enough to fly efficiently while being robust enough to process insect exoskeletons. So we look forward to exploring um, analyses of uh, bone density further. We can also reconstruct internal morphology of the inner ear, internal morphology of the brain cavity volume, and tooth morphology um, to assess their roles in echolocation, foraging ecology, habitat complexity, and dietary specialization. We're very excited that these data will be publicly available on repositories such as MorphoSource uh, to allow further exploration in bat skull morphology between species and within species. And with that, I'd like to say that I'm incredibly thankful to all of the natural history collections that granted me access to their specimens for imaging as well as the instrument manager at the Center for Electron Microscopy and Analysis, my two undergraduate assistants, Abby and Paige, members of the Karstens Lab, and support from the Image Omics Institute. I'd also, of course, love to thank my funding sources, the Ranges Project, the Ohio State Alumni Grants, and Society of Systematic Biologists. And thank you all for being here. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sydney. That was great. Um, 
And uh, so if folks have questions for Sydney, uh, please drop them in the Q&A. Uh, we would appreciate that. And we'll get to those um, as soon as we possibly can. Uh, but just to keep things moving along, uh, the next uh, presentation is um, uh, a pre-recorded uh, uh, presentation uh, because uh, Jose is in the field. Uh, Jose Gabriel Martinez Fonseca is at Northern Arizona University, uh, and the presentation is on the assessment of phenotypic differences within and between Zappos species in the Western United States. Uh, so, Kit, I will allow you your magic fingers uh, to hit the right buttons and uh, send us off on that recorded message. Okay. And let me know if nobody can hear this, but you should be able to hear and see this. Which is titled Assessing Phenotypic Great. Difference. Thanks, Kit. It would be really helpful if I did it from the beginning. Okay. Hello there, and thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is Jose Gabriel Martinez Fonseca. I am a postdoc at Northern Arizona University, and today I will be talking a bit about our project, which is titled Assessing Phenotypic Differences of Sapus in the Western United States. So um, let's jump into it. The New Mexico Meadow Jumping Mouse, or Sapus luteus, is a species endemic to the Southwestern United States. As I say before, it is an riparian obligate, which means it only inhabits this narrow um, habitat around perennial waters. And this species was listed in danger under the ESA or Species Endangered Species Act uh, back in 2014. And the main reasons for this was because population decline linked by habitat destruction, some types of recreation that will trample or eliminate some of the vegetation that they need, and also is threatened by climate change. The species is found on um, a few isolated uh, populations through Eastern Arizona, Central and Northern New Mexico, and Southern Colorado. As you can see here in the map on the left, uh, and those points are basically like the populations that we know of. Uh, this potentially uh, additional habitat in between, as we can see in this uh, heat map here on the right, which is a species distribution model. But um, these, are, these on the left are the ones that uh, we know of. Now, something um, curious happened and is that on some of these isolated populations, like in Arizona, these blue dots, or central New Mexico, the purple dots, uh, this is the only species on the genus that occurs. But in areas of northern New Mexico and southern Colorado, there are other species on the same genus that um, are in sympathy with the species. And the thing is, some of these other species are not threatened. So Knowing where the boundaries and distribution of these species in these areas are is extremely important for management and for um, protection or, or restoration of habitat. So with these things in mind, we wanted to see if we can reliably identify these three species of sapus in the field by just looking at, the, at them since it's really hard to collect any of these ones because of they're in danger. And especially in this area of sympathy and using just the pillage of other morphometric measurements that we can do in the field. But also we wanted to see if within these isolated populations, there are any phenotypic differences and across the entire range, especially in uh, Arizona and um, New Mexico. So our first step was to um, look for data. And thankfully, we have museums for that. And we were able so far to access um, over 600 skins of specimens collected pretty much over the last century all over the uh, Western United States. And here you can see the five museums that have granted us access so far. 
and the specimens where we were able to to photograph and uh, these numbers of specimens we were especially interested on the ones from the four corner area um, that's utah arizona colorado new mexico but also we included some out groups which will be skins for other specimens uh, of other species outside the range for comparison and this is what we have been doing we go to the to the museum and we use a camera with a color calibration chart and we take ventral and dorsal photos of the of the specimens with a with a scale so we can also we can not only color correct but also uh, conduct measurements based on the photograph and like i say we have gone through quite a few so far and we are this is i mean i'm giving this talk but we are still like gathering the data and seeing the best way to process it but basically we have been seeing there's going to be some interesting uh differences for example this species has some populations that are relatively low elevation in the rio grande in central new mexico and seen for what we can tell right now, some of these individuals of low elevation are paler or, or yeah, than the than the ones from high elevations, like the ones in Arizona. Here we have on the left a low elevation side and a higher elevation on the right. We also see a lot of variation of other species. So this first eight on the left, the first two columns are Sapus lurius or a species of interest, but also we see that on some other populations like the ones on the right, the first two on top, uh, this band on the on the back quite uh, changes within some of these populations. And just for reference, this one from Boulder is actually a different species, and um, as you can tell, you, they're slightly different. So here you can see an example of a color calibrated photo. We input this into R and extract color data in red, blue, green, or RGB color space. So in this graph, each dot represents one pixel of the photograph of the mouse in the RGB space. Now here um, we have been the colors from all the pixels into eight groups, and we can get the relative amount of each color group per organism. Once we have this information for all individuals, we can conduct a statistical analysis to see if they grew by population or species, or if the variation in color is more continuous. So here in an example of this clustering analysis, where each row and column is in this chart represents an individual mouse, and the color represents how far they are from one another in RGB color space. Here, pink means that um, they are more similar in color, and blue means that they are uh, more different. We can use this type of analysis to see if individuals are clustering by population, species, geography, or something else. We also plan on conducting some additional color analysis, such as a scoring of discrete characters like white on the ear tips or measuring the width of that dark uh, dorsal line. In addition to photographing skins, we have been micro CT scanning ethanol preserved specimens of Sapus lurius and other members of the genus Sapus. One great thing about CT scans is that they allow us to visualize and quantify internal anatomy as well as very small structures such as teeth and claws. We plan to take linear measurements of a lot of morphological features as well as as do 3D landmarking to look at potential differences in shape. This will help us understand if there are reliable differences in morphology between these different populations and species. These specimens on the screen were loaned to us from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and we scanned them just last week at UC Berkeley. We are really grateful to institutions that have allowed us to examine their specimens, and of course, all of these scans will be made publicly available on MorphoSource in the very near future. We hope that the information product of this research will help secure habitat for these endangered species 
that we also benefit many others throughout this range. We want to thank the Rangers Mini Imaging Award for the funding, as well as all the collection managers and personnel from institutions and museums that have provided specimens for this project. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent. And uh, <clears throat> Jose will be watching this uh, after he returns from the field. He's actually in the field right now looking for more mice and doing what he does. Um, and so, uh, Jose, thank you so much for preparing that um, uh, that presentation in advance uh, and before you left for the field. Um, and so if you have questions for Jose, um, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, we'll get those questions to him and and I'll try to keep a, a a log of who asked what question and and see if we can't get uh, answers back to you. Uh, he does check his email periodically from the field, so uh, we can try to make that happen for you. Uh, also note, Sydney, um, if you'd like to go in and answer questions in the Q and A, you are more than welcome to do so at any point. Uh, although I understand if you'd prefer to watch the presentations too, if that's all right. Um, <clears throat> So uh, we'll just keep things moving right along here. Um, our next uh, speaker, uh, Priscilla D'Souza, is uh, currently at Cornell University, where it is still warm and not cold just yet. Uh, she is uh, going to be uh, speaking to us about the in interesting and alliterative evolutionary and temporal variation of miniaturized mammalian morphologies. So it's all yours, Priscilla. Uh... Are you seeing yourself in the screen? Sorry, how do I remove this from here? No, uh, you're, okay. you're, 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 you, everything looks good. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to present my mini morph project, which, are part, which is a part of my postdoc project here at Cornell, funded by Ranges on the evolutionary and temporal variation of miniaturized mammalian morphologies. So let's skip for the introduction and go directly to the superstars of this project, which are the Sauricidae family, or shrews, which are these tiny animals that look a lot like rodents, but they are not. Although, yes, they are very, very tiny. So, for example, you might be aware of the smallest mammal alive alongside with the bumblebee bat, which is, the, which is a shrew, is the Etruscan shrew. But such reduced body sizes is not just the only interesting thing about this group. So, we have uh, such a wide array of interesting particularities about this group that makes them a very interesting model system to work with. So for example, we have cases of shoes that have poisonous saliva, that have just, they can display echolocation or a caravan behavior, or we have this crazy vertebral morphology of hero shoes. And we also have this very interesting phenomenon and with some species, they shrink their brain and their brain case during winter, and then they regrow it back during summer, a phenomenon known as the Denos phenomenon. And for this project, I'm interested in understanding these two aspects. So one, this miniaturization issues, and second, the Denos phenomenon. So to begin with, I'm interested in a macroevolutionary approach to understand how such miniaturization issues has contributed to their diversification. So as I mentioned, they are not rodents, so they are in the Elipodifla family, meaning that they are closely related to selenodons, moles, and hedgehogs. And which is very interesting because just Sauricides, they compose 80% of the total species diversity of Elipodifla, which is very impressive, it's a lot. And if we look here at this phylogeny, which is showing as a ancestral reconstruction of body mass, we can see that the shrews right here, they are, they are described by very warm colors, meaning that they are very small compared to their outgroups right here that are more, that are bigger in size. And if we compare with uh, the whole distribution of body mass diversity in mammals that is described here in this histogram with the blue layer right here, and again, our friend Etruscan shrew on the other extreme, we have here, the distribution of shrews compared to other mammals, and with a medium body mass of only nine grams, which is very, very small. However, it's despite that very small sizes, uh, it's, very, it's very interesting that shrews are very successful on the way that they are interacting with their surrounding environment. 
So we have cases of shoes that are semi-aquatic, semi-fossorial, or they are capable of climbing as well, meaning that they are very successful in the way that they interact, while at the same time, they keep this very curious uh, and very particular, very characteristic shoe-like morphology without changing much, which might be uh, a consequence of their miniaturized body sizes. So my first question here is to understand if such miniaturization in these animals is associated with their outstanding taxonomic diversity, so it has contributed to the speciation of this group, and if it's associated with some particular phenotypic pattern of evolution as well that is different from other ulipotic ones. So the first problem is that to do that, I needed to acquire morphological data um, and to have a, 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 actually an interesting data set. It was complex because there are many species that are not available in online repositories. So I had to CT scan them myself. And luckily we have ranges supporting this project. And a couple of months ago, I was able to CT scan about 50, 50 species of shrews and other ones that was previously unavailable in these online repositories. And once we gather all this scan, we took these scans to the lab and we have a motivated and very enthusiastic uh, team of young researchers, grad and undergrad students that are using this data as a training on geometric morphometrics data where they're using to segment and to conduct their projects uh, of their own as well. And also to collect part of this data. So unfortunately, this data, we're still in progress of collecting this data sets, so we are not able to show you any preliminary results so far. Uh, but what I can tell you is that we are aiming to use state-dependent diversification models to respond to these questions, uh, evolutionary model adequacy as well. And in future, we are planning to include rodents and to compare if miniaturization into in, um, that occurred in, in these two separated groups is associated with similar or different evolutionary processes. But what we hope to find is that yes, miniaturization has promoted speciation in shrews uh, and that it has facilitated ecological radiation but restricted morphological evolution due to that very tiny sizes. And the second part of my project, I am to now not anymore look at the macroevolutionary pattern, but at the intraspecific diversity level to explore the Daniels phenomenon. Uh, so this phenomenon has been widely studied in this Eurasian shrew represented right here. And what people have noticed with time is that as these animals are born as juveniles during summer, uh, their brain case that is represented here in this axis is relatively large. But as the, the seasons progress and the animals become adults, with winter, the brain case redu reduces and then it regrows back in their adulthood in the next summer. And what is very curious here is that these studies have not looked at the postcranial pattern of morphological variation, which is super interesting because just if you look at rodents here as well in North America, uh, that although they do not display this Dennis phenomenon that I just mentioned, if you look at the postcranial variation, uh, the mineralization, the degree of mineralization of their bones is very different in summer that is here presented with the bones of the humerus and the femur being more mineralized here than in winter when the resources are more scarce. So is it possible that the postcranial of shrews is also uh, exhibiting this kind of Dennis phenomenon of shrinking and then regrowing? So that's the question that we aim to, to, to understand, uh, looking at the postcranial internal and external anatomy. And of this species here that is very charismatic, the smoky shrew, uh, that is quite abundant in the western coast, in the eastern coast of the U.S. Uh, and what is kind of cool, very cool here, is that we are proposing another model system to study this phenomenon. This has been mostly described with the uh, with with the other Eurasian shoe that I showed you before. But because of that, the first thing that we had to do was to come here at the Cornell's collection and look if this species indeed exhibit this kind of Dennis phenomenon. Uh, and by comparing samples that were collected across different seasons, we immediately observed that specimens from the summer that were collected in the summer, they have a much greater, uh, much higher brain case and skull case here than specimens collected in spring and in the fall. 
So that motivated us to keep going further. So we are going to explore this question and I have started to scan some smoke issues, but I'm coming back next week to the CT scanner to get more samples. And we are favoring uh, specimens that are here from the Tompkins County so we can reduce interpopulation of variation. And then we are going to acquire again all of the morphometric data, but we are also uh, benefit from the CT scans to get data on the internal anatomy to respond to this question and then compare their morphology across the seasons. Also, this is still a work in progress. We are finishing the CT scans next week, but stay tuned for more. And we expect to find that yes, just like the skull, the postcranial anatomy shrinks during fall and winter and regrows in spring and summer. And with that, I would like to thank you for the invitation and to Rangers for supporting this research to the collections that provided the specimens. And stay tuned for, for our research and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Priscilla, this is great. Um, uh, thank you so much for uh, for making that presentation and uh, uh, sharing your research with us. I have to say so far, uh, not to put any pressure on Brian here, uh, but uh, so far, you know, uh, these presentations have been great. It's really cool to see what research is going on. Uh, there's some good questions happening in the Q&A, uh, some of which have been answered or will be answered shortly um, in the case of questions for Jose. Uh, and others that are still pending. Uh, but so we can get to some of the discussion about those questions, uh, I'm gonna keep going uh, here and moving this along. Again, thank you Priscilla for that presentation. Uh, the last presentation today uh, is uh, Brian Tennis, who's at Oregon State University, uh, I believe in Corvallis down south there. Uh, and he's gonna be speaking to us uh, about the spatial and temporal variation of bite force in commas pocket gophers. Brian, it is all yours. Excellent, thanks. Hopefully you can all see my screen here. Yeah, looks good. Yeah, so I'm Brian Tannis. I'm actually not in Corvallis. I'm at Oregon State University Cascades, which is a small satellite campus of undergrads out in Bend in central Oregon. Uh, but I will be talking mostly about Corvallis area today. And so I really want to thank everyone, uh, particularly Ranges, for funding this project and everyone for sticking with me here and to the last of our talks. So I want to start out first by talking about uh, not necessarily the species that I'm interested in, but the place. And so I want to kind of focus on this variation in one spot, specifically the Willamette Valley in Oregon. And the Willamette Valley, if you've never been there or know of it, it is essentially an incredibly varied landscape. It's only about 240 kilometers long in a river valley spanning the Willamette River. And yet it contains a, a impressive variety of landscape. Uh, it currently has over 200 different commercial crops being grown, which is more than any other similar sized area in the United States. If you also know anything about the Willamette Valley though, it also contains over 70% of the Oregon population. And we have these very large urban centers as well as suburban sites that are really juxtaposed with these agricultural and protected natural landscapes, all within this very small valley. Now, not only is there tremendous spatial variation, but temporally there has been pronounced changes to human land use. Not only has right farming practices changed and what crop types have been used over long periods of times, but also right differences in just overall land use in terms of urban and agricultural centers. And this goes back not just to Western settlements, uh, but for thousands of years of indigenous cultures. And importantly, I want to acknowledge the fact that the Willamette Valley is the ancestral homelands of many individuals of the Kalpulia people, who were all forcibly removed in 1855 from those lands, which includes Oregon State University's Corvallis campus. And today, all of the living descendants of those people are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde community and the Confederated Tribes of the Silitz Indians further in the eastern portion of the state. 
Now, I detail all of this kind of space of the valley and its tremendous variation because it is the exclusive home to the Camas pocket gopher. This small burrowing rodent is fully endemic to the Willamette Valley, persisting here for thousands of years, essentially from Ice Age floods all the way through the modern era, despite currently being listed as a pest species for agriculture. And I find it fairly interesting uh, that this Camas pocket gopher is one of the most understudied members of this genus of pocket gophers, in particular because it is a, a like small endemic population, but it's also very morphologically distinct from other members of the genus. It's significantly larger than other members of the mummies, and it has much greater features of the skull. For example, there are really pronounced angular or transverse angular processes along the lower jaw. And a lot of these pronounced and distinct features of the commas pocket gophers are likely associated with burrowing through the soil. And similar to many members of the genus, the commas pocket gopher is primarily going to burrow through the soil using its jaw, essentially chewing its way through these complex soil textures to make what essentially they live in full time. And now the burrows and these gophers, again, can be found in, across the entirety of the Willamette Valley despite there being a very, very large degree of both natural and anthropogenic variation seen in this landscape. And so here on the left, I'm showing a map of just soil units at a 50 meter resolution across the extent of the Willamette Valley and a little bit further west. And if you're familiar with the Willamette Valley or Eastern Oregon at all, I've also put in dots for the large urban centers, Portland, Salem, Corvallis, and Eugene in this spot to give you a little bit of a frame of reference. And you can see, hopefully, right from this map that there is just a tremendous amount of natural variation in the types of soils that these gophers are experiencing. And now I didn't have time to make a similar map of land use across the valley over space or time, but you can be sure that right, the variation is essentially equally as varied. Now, lots of other studies for other burrowing mammals have shown that the traits associated with digging through these dense soil properties really are going to be reflected in right, complex traits, particularly those associated with muscles and lever systems. We also know from a couple of the few studies on the commas pocket gopher that they tend to have pretty limited dispersal, and it appears that they exist in some genetic isolation from one population or region to another population within the valley. And so in my mind, this jumps out as me as potentially leading to these very unique communities with different trajectories for possibly right, moving towards different plastic traits or trait variation over time. And so I am really interested then in this study in trying to quantify the variation in this skull morphology across this spatial and temporal extent. And really I'm interested in testing the degree to which any variation in these traits is going to correspond with these environmental and anthropogenic factors, and hopefully be able to then maybe tease apart what types of variation is driven by human influence versus natural influence. And this might be able to give us a better idea of what these populations and other rodents in equally diverse and human-centric landscapes might be facing in the future. Now we're interested in looking at all types of standard measures of the skull, uh, but in particular, I'm interested in traits that are associated with bite force and biomechanics of the jaw. And this is because, right, this is how they are going to be really interacting with the environment, constructing their burrows through these soils and agricultural landscapes. And so we're really interested in looking at biomechanics as well as bone densities for finite element analysis and other, other models. We're also really interested in various explanatory properties such as right soil properties and textures like I showed a little bit before as well as agricultural types and intensities, urbanization, and of course just general aspects of climate change throughout the valley. Now I've started sampling from museum specimens and I really want to give a special thanks to the 
collections and people that have allowed me access to specimens, particularly the KU Biodiversity Institute, the Puget Sound Museum of Natural History, as well as the vertebrate collection at Oregon State University. And so far we've been sampling and thanks to ranges I've been able to get micro CT scans of the skulls of many of these pocket gophers and we've been doing our micro CT scanning at the Liam bioimaging facility at the Friday Harbor laboratories of the University of Washington. Now so far I've only been able to scan about 60 specimens covering a fairly large and temporal spatial or and temporal range. Uh, but in two weeks, I am going back up to the scanning facility and will be hopefully more than doubling that amount to get up to around 145 specimens that really are going to be covering and spanning a range from the early 1910s all the way through the early 2000s. Now, obviously, right, I don't have all of these scanned or imaged, and so I don't really have much data to show you at this time, but I do want to give you kind of a little bit of some preliminary data that we've done just on two-dimensional analyses and two-dimensional reconstructions of bite force from photographs. And so far, really interestingly, we don't see any clear associations with these 2D estimates of bite force and soil properties, which is rather unexpected considering in most other fossil real species, we see very tight similarities between environmental gradients and the uh, output forces. One tantalizing evidence that we're really excited to look at with the better resolution of 3D data with these micro CT scans is that there does appear to be greater differences and variation across time than there is in space, which suggests to me that there could be a really strong anthropomorphic signal for the variation in this species rather than purely due to environmental gradients. And I'm essentially out of time here. And so I'm really happy to acknowledge and thank lots of people. Again, the Ranges program for providing me with the funding to do this project, as well as the many uh, museum collections and curators, as well as the U UW for allowing me to use their scanning facility, as well as many undergraduate assistants who are helping me currently to clean up and get these scans ready for analyses. And with that, I'll wrap up and Hopefully take some questions. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. That was great. Uh, my apologies for attaching you to, to Corvallis when it should have been Cascades. Shame on me uh, for that. Uh, but uh, excellent presentation. And in fact, um, to all, all four of you who presented today, uh, great presentations. And thank you so much for uh, sticking to the time. Uh, that doesn't happen very often that everybody does it and you guys did. So gold star for this uh, webinar uh, in that regard. Um, we do have some time for a couple of questions. Uh, and we can also spill over a little bit um, if, if we need to, if people have uh, some things to discuss uh, as necessary, but not too long. Um, but uh, so I thought uh, we'd just jump right back up to uh, to Sydney, I know you answered a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A and folks can find those answers there. Uh, but uh, Greg Watkins Caldwell uh, was curious about uh, a, a hole and or what looked like a hole in the middle of the head. Uh, one of your uh, one of your scans. So I wonder if you want to say anything about that. Uh, of course. Um, so that um, I think. Mark asked a similar question. There are a lot of artifacts from the surface model reconstruction due to a lot of thin spots in the cranial bones of bats um, in order to keep the crania light enough to fly efficiently. Um, so I think that is likely an, an artifact of the reconstruction procedure to create that specific um, figure. Um, we're working through a lot of different options for our automated processing pipeline that should address issues with differences in CT intensity values between those thin spots in the crania and the really high intensity values uh, given off by the enamel in the teeth. So hopefully um, our, our actual data will look a little bit cleaner than that. Anything to follow up with, Greg, or are you good? Uh, 
All right, Greg's good. He has sent me that message telepathically, so I understand. Uh, all right, let's see another question. Um, let's see here. Uh, so, which one shall we pick? Uh, one from um, Charlene Santana uh, for you, Priscilla. Uh, could there be differences in how males and females exhibit and bounce back from these reductions in brain size and bone thickness? Uh, would you be able to explore this with your data? I was just about to type the reply. Uh, so probably yes, uh, but we we are also taking into account sex variation. The problem is that when in most of the collections we just have the information that in most when they are juveniles we don't have the sex they just say juveniles. So that might be a little bit tricky. So we probably have the information of juveniles and then compare adults, males and females. But that's something that we still have to look at. But that would be interesting, and we definitely want to consider them. Anything to follow up with, Charlene? Well, maybe Charlene can't speak, or maybe nobody from the gallery can speak, in which case we can say all kinds of things about both Greg and Charlene uh, at will. Um, uh, let's she see said here. thank you in the... I, I saw that, yeah. Um, let's see, uh, there is a question for Brian. Uh, from Elizabeth Womack. She's at uh, University of Wyoming. Uh, we get a number of po pocket gophers from ranchers every year when they clear out some of their fields. So are you getting modern material from the Willamette Valley to compare to your historic material? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm currently not actively sampling or um, I know that right there, they're labeled as a pest species. And so there's a lot of right, extermination groups that are currently trying to remove gophers from the agriculture reasons. I've gotten in contact with a few to try to get their specimens. I'm still kind of working with them. A lot of them are not the most cooperative in terms of they don't just understand the, the idea of right museum collections. Uh, and so I do have some kind of modern collections from again, the early 2000s, but nothing from right the current time period. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so let's see here. So some of these folks are ranges people, others are, are not, uh, but it's great to see everyone here. Uh, I know that we are closing in on the hour here. We have about uh, 40 seconds or so. And so for those people that do need to drop off, um, we want to thank you for attending. Uh, we appreciate this. This is the first in a series of of talks on TCNs uh, that are a part of the IDIG Bio project. Um, and if uh, Kit, if you're able to drop the link into the chat one more time for all of the future presentations so people can see what's coming up, that would be awesome. Uh, there's, there's some magic from Jill on the screen also. Um, uh, so feel free to join us for those future TCNs. Um, and in the meantime, um, let's see here. Uh, so I just wanted to, so all of the recordings for um, within this webinar series will be posted on the wiki page, which is linked to that announcement, that original announcement page. Um, and then just in case you haven't heard, I just also wanted to make a quick little plug for BioDigicon. Hopefully it's on everyone's calendar for September 2025. Um, there'll be a lot more information coming that coming your way soon. Um, but we do have a website that's um, just kind of starting to become active, uh, biodigicon.org. Uh, more information will be posted there. Um, but yep, just those couple of quick announcements. And thank you again to all of the speakers. Yeah, and uh, thanks to Jill and Kit for uh, getting this squared away and organized and up uh, so that everyone could join us. Uh, I see that uh, Priscilla and Brian are answering the remaining questions in the Q&A. Uh, and so what we will do is we will uh, make sure to post all of these answers, at least on the Ranges website. Um, uh, Brian uh, McLean, if you feel like dropping the URL for Ranges into the chat for everybody, that would be great. 
Uh, we'll also have a recording linked uh, or a link to the recording uh, on the on the website as well as soon as that goes live. Uh, but as soon as those questions are answered, um, we will we'll shut everything down. And I uh, hope everybody has a good remainder to their Thursday. Uh, and thank you all for uh, for joining us. Of course, uh, thank you all to uh, to Sydney, uh, Jose, uh, Priscilla, and Brian for your presentations today. They were great. Uh, we really appreciate uh, that you're a part of the Ranges Project and that you're doing great work out there in the world. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye.